Okay, so hi Becca, could you introduce yourself and tell us your name, where you come from, and where you live now? Aloha, my name is Rebecca Dickens O'Hara, and I am from Kentucky and Indiana originally, um, and then I spent quite a few years, a little over a decade in Northern California, and now I live in Volcano. Um, and what is your vai mauna and or ahupua, where you live or where you connect to the most? Um, well, I live about 10 minutes away from Mauna Loa Road. Um, so I'd say Mauna Loa right now is definitely a place that I connect to the most. Um, I get to visit there pretty frequently. Um, and so, and I just love the ecosystem up there. Um, it's really diverse. There's koa, ohia, pukiave, um, a'ali'i, manele. Yeah, there's a lot of diversity and it's a really cool um, ecosystem as you hike up the mountain. Um, you can see it changing. So I really love Mauna Loa. Great. And can you tell us what your job title is at the moment and where do you work? Yeah, so I'm the CEO of Akaka Foundation for Tropical Forests, and we're a nonprofit organization focused on biocultural stewardship, biocultural education, and sustainable livelihood development. And so at the Akaka Foundation, what are some of your roles and responsibilities, and what does an average day look like for you? Well, as a small nonprofit, um, you if you're an, employed by a small nonprofit, you tend to wear many hats. So um, my average day can can range from I do a lot of bookkeeping and accounting type things. Um, I do a lot of grant grant writing and reporting. Um, I interact with staff and employees and make sure they have everything they need. Um, and then I get to kind of strategize and um, think about sort of where we want our programs to go and and that part of. Um, the position is really fun for me to, to be able to help, you know, envision how we're going to, you know, fulfill our, our vision of, you know, supporting biocultural stewardship and that kind of thing. So we um, get to be part of a community forest, um, Hui, where we support uh, the development of a community forest in Pubaba, and that's really rewarding. Um, and then I get to have a little bit of involvement in, in our educational programs as well. So it's really dynamic. Um, some days I'm designing brochures, um, some days I'm grant writing. So it really just depends on the day. And so you mentioned some of them, but what are the main programs that Akaka Foundation is working on right now or that you're involved in? Um, so Teaching Change, which is, um, a collaboration between the USDA Forest Service and the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, focuses on biocultural education and STEM-based education. Um, and then Ulu Lehu Lehu is a program of ours that um, is also in, in um, collaboration with the USDA Forest Service. And that, that program is focused on Ohia Lehua and really, um, you know, protecting and promoting the species. So looking at um, increasing um, the presence of ohia in communities and workplaces, um, in the native forests and also in urban environments um, and, and teaching students and community members about ohia and helping sort of build that connection because um, ohia is a really important tree biologically um, and also culturally. Um, so that's Ulu Lehu Lehu, Million Ohia Initiative. And then we support the Puvava community-based subsistence forest area, which is a pilot program to establish a community-based forest um, at Puvava on state land. So that's a really exciting um, program that we support. And those are really our, our main focuses right now. Great. And so what made you interested in having the career that you've chosen and being involved with all of these initiatives? Yeah, so I started out my undergraduate um, career focused in anthropology. Um, and I was really interested in the, the just diversity of cultures around the world. 
um, and also how we interact with our environment. Um, but my focus actually in undergrad was um, on primate studies because um, I love monkeys and apes. Um, and so, so that was my big focus during undergrad. Um, so I had the opportunity to sort of delve deeply into that and do some field programs um, in Costa Rica. Um, and that was really helpful for me to kind of see what what it's like to, to do science, um, to actually, you know, do some field research. Um, so I was really interested in that um, and really motivated by um, just the, the need to protect species of the earth. Um, but monkeys were really my primary focus. Um, but the more I studied that, um, the more I just fell in love with the forest and just felt like a good approach is to sort of look at protecting the forest and, and that sort of enables and supports, you know, all of the species within it. So, so that kind of became my shift in focus um, after my undergrad. So um, then I went into a master's program at Humboldt State University called Environment and Community. And that kind of you know, helped me put together the the social and ecological dimensions um, of of conservation. So, so there I studied. Um, my my thesis title was something like social and ecological dimensions of conservation in Ecuador. So I got to do some some research in Ecuador and really focus on the interaction between communities and sustainable livelihoods and conservation. So um, it was really a, a dynamic and interesting way to sort of integrate, um, you know, a passion for forests and also um, for communities being able to support themselves with sustainable livelihoods. So and then said, now um, I'm actually in a PhD program at Purdue University studying community managed forests. So kind of Kind of, it's kind of been a logical progression um, from a more um, hard science, um, you know, studying monkeys and monitoring their behavior to looking at um, how people can live sustainably with their environments. So you did your undergrad and then you got a master's degree and then now you're getting a PhD. Has that kind of been your academic pathway or did you um, have any stops and starts in between? Yeah, so I actually didn't go to start college until I was 21. So um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do um, after high school. And um, I just kind of waited until I had some better ideas um, and saved a little bit of money um, to support that. And then, yeah, I, I kind of took my time with school. Um, I would I would do a year here and then take a break, save some money and do another year. Um, so I, I took some time and, and I didn't know what, I, I had no idea that I was gonna pursue a PhD. Um, and, and that's kind of been, it's just been an opportunity that was, you know, presented itself to me through my work. Um, and I'm really happy to have had that opportunity um, now that I'm in it. Um, it's been a really good experience and I've learned a lot um, but it wasn't, it wasn't something I set out to do from the time I was a high school student or anything. Um, I really didn't know um, if I was going to pursue music or photography. I, I had no idea <laughs> at, at, you know, at my younger ages. So, um, but it's, I'm really happy that I pursued the path I did now because I, I really love my work and um, it's super fulfilling. And was it those research experiences that um, kind of made you decide to study biology and kind of the natural resource aspect of it instead of music or photography? Or was it something else? Yeah, I think it was just, you know, reading some books on anthropology got me interested in anthropology. And then um, from there, you know, it was just kind of an organic progression, I think. Um, um, the more I learned about, you know, the environment and sort of, you know, 
the destruction of many of our ecosystems, the more I wanted to be involved in um, supporting, um, you know, the integrity of the Earth's ecosystems. And then, you know, the more I studied that, the more I felt like, you know, it's really important that, that people have a way to interact with um, their natural environment in a way that's culturally appropriate, in a way that, you know, satisfies their, you know, cultural heritage, and also in a way that um, is sustainable and, and allows people to, you know, thrive within their environment. So it was kind of just an organic progression of, you know, the more I learned and kind of put these pieces together, that's sort of where my, you know, thinking about conservation went was to, to a more human centered um, approach to conservation. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned the primate research, but besides that, or even including that, were there any other types of professional development experiences that helped you get where you are, such as internships or summer programs? Um, and what were the skills that you've gained there or even in that research experience that you felt that were important for the rest of your career and moving forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did, during my undergrad, I did um, quite a bit of volunteering. So um, I was part of a, a club that was focused on primate conservation and I would um, help professors sort of organize conferences and seminars. Um, so that was really helpful for me in kind of getting a, a framework in um, grant writing. I, I started my first grant writing in um, undergrad. Um, so it, it kind of sort of gave me a foundation to kind of see how to organize things. Um, I helped organize a, an activism and conservation speaker series. Um, and I also helped organize a, a primate conservation speaker series. And so those were really um, helpful experiences to just kind of learn how to do that and, you know, experience that and how, um, you know, energizing that kind of thing can be to, to be part of something that's bigger than you. Um, and then, you know, it felt really good to, to be engaged in, in fundraising for primate conservation um, and to, to see the impact of that. Um, and then I was also part of, um, I was able to be a teacher's assistant in Costa Rica. Um, and that was a very cool experience at, at a primate field school. Um, so that was, you know, that taught me a lot in terms of you know, I got to be a field guide and, and I, I could just kind of see the, the myriad pathways that were opened up um, through, you know, that natural resource um, focus. Um, yeah, so I think, I think just being engaged and, and really trying to be helpful and supportive in the, the programs that were happening locally, um, it, it really helped me um, sort of learn how to, you know, interact with funders, learn how to interact with speakers and um, people who, you know, are at a different level in their careers than me. Um, so yeah, those experiences, I think, really supported my development and, and made me feel confident enough to kind of pursue um, more, more education and, and different career opportunities. Thank you. Um, super helpful. And what is your favorite part of being the CEO of the Kaka Foundation and your least favorite part? Oh, um, my favorite part is definitely working with, um, you know, we're able to, to hire a lot of local um, young adults and youth and we have some mentorship programs um, and that's probably my favorite part just being able to to support local local students and um, you know college students and young adults um, so that's probably my favorite part um, and also you know the the rare days when I get to go outside and be tree planting or be a part of um, one of our programs is pretty rewarding. Um, my least favorite part is 
probably bookkeeping um that that ends up being a big part of what I do is you know sitting in front of a computer and crunching numbers um which some days I find it you know relaxing and I can just put on some music and um go with it and other days I just I just want to be outside so (laughs) definitely I think we all feel that way sometimes (laughs) um and so our last question is what advice would you give to your middle school self hmm I mean, I think it would have been great if when I were in middle school, if I would have sort of known to pursue um, my curiosities a little bit more. So I think I I was a very outdoorsy kid and I was always in the, the woods um, by myself. I grew up in Indiana, so we call the forest woods there. Um, and I was always out there with my dogs, um, but I didn't engage my curiosity with the natural environment um, as much, like, in the same way that I do now. So now I'm, if I go in the forest, I'm kind of like, what is that tree? And looking at the interactions. So I think that would have been, you know, maybe I would have pursued, um, you know, science earlier had I had I done that but I don't think I really knew to do that I just enjoyed being out in the forest (laughs) um but yeah I mean I think I think I would have taken some more steps to kind of build my career path but um but it all worked out I I didn't do that um and I I didn't know what I wanted to do um really for a very long time um but eventually I figured it out um so I don't regret pursuing other ambitions. Um, I was really into photography for a while. I thought I was going to be a harpist for a while. (laughs) And I worked at a music store after, after, um, high school. And, you know, those were, when I look back now, those were enjoyable pursuits and worthwhile in their own way. But, um, definitely I think if you have the option to sort of, look at the various um, opportunities and what might fit your personality um, and your interest levels. Um, I think that's, that's a good way to start, like not to get too, too fixated on, on one thing, um, you know, when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, but really exploring sort of the different options out there and, and looking at how how people who are in different careers enjoy their careers and what the benefits of those are, I think, I think would be helpful. It's good to know too, though, that, you know, you can not know and you can still need time to make a decision and that can feel stressful, but you'll make it to where you're supposed to be eventually and come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Mahalo, Becca. (laughs) This has been great. Thank you so much.